So I brought some works uh, to show you to add a little context uh, to what I do, and I have um, um, hopefully uh, I can sort of spring through it all, and, and and we can have a chat afterwards. And Chris seems seems to have a few questions as well. Uh, but let me just start by uh, st somewhere else because I think it's it's an in interesting discussion to which I don't have a precise answer. Is to talk about what is it we are actually doing here. And why do we go to a museum and why is the museum here in the first place and, and what is all of this uh, essentially doing and, 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 and so on. And obviously what I say is not necessarily the answer to it and certainly not the one that every artist necessarily would subscribe to and they shouldn't of course. But the, this, this notion that, um, that we are here to uh, look of art of course has more complex, um, how should I say, more com complexity than that. And I, I just like to refer to this uh, within a certain model or an idea that, that I have found uh, productive for me. And that is the, the relationship we have with art can both be seen in a microscopic or a micro or in intimate, a highly subjective, something really personal. And there's another end to that, which is the macro, the kind of the grand scale of the things that the museums does or the cultural institutions does, right? So maybe I can just briefly, as, as a little source of inspiration maybe, but also as a, as a sort of a little matrix to how I as an artist work, because I'm incredibly interested in what happens when a person is in a situation in which art is involved. I mean, personally, what happens when you go up looking at a painting, looking at a work of art, engaging, physically engaging, a sort of embodied seeing, if you want. All these many ways in which or through which we can uh, engage in art or we can be hosted by art and we can sort of play with art or you know, we can be deeply contemplative or we can be very light-minded sort of odin and drifting through uh, this thing, right? Inside of this intimate uh, sort of potential there lies maybe um, there's a few ideas, but one I like in particular is that we all probably know the experience where you are, and this is not just art, or reading a book, listening to music, theatre, there's culture as such, but you're looking at a painting or a work of art and say, I know this feeling, I know, I, I understand what the artist is saying because I feel the same way. It is as if the artist is giving structure, language, colour, form, to something I was about to finally articulate or say or do, but I had not come around to give it, give it structure yet. So interestingly, it was as if the painting or the book was listening to me. It was as if it reflected my not yet articulated emotional need. It somehow gave also importance to what I wanted to say, and I felt I was listened to, and I felt well, if it's listening to me, I must be good enough. And the great, I think, one of the great luxuries of a cultural institution is when it works really well, it is as if it listens to you. And when you leave, you feel that you were given the authorship or the role of co-producing the museum because you went in not to be told what to say and do and, and, and how to be, but actually to share your vision on what do you think the future is essentially, or the future imaginary, or yourself is actually capable of. See? So that's an interesting idea, and of course one can dive into what does it mean to be emotionally uh, reflected, you could call it. How, how does it feel that somebody is in fact mirroring me? So these are the micro things. There's a number of ways of looking at it, but, um, and I find great inspiration in sort of, sort of diving into this. Where is there room for this intimacy? Well, to, to have that kind of intimate experience, and to feel that you are being hosted, this notion of hospitality, and in particular then when you're in the room with somebody you don't know, but you might disagree with. When a qualitative hospitality exercises its greatest potential, it becomes like a safe space in which you can be with people without, without whom you agree, and you can still be together. So it has a sort of profound, almost democratic quality where you can actually share something without having to be the same. And looking at society, and we can see how the polarization and the sort of challenges of handling otherness uh, is, is popping up. So suddenly we have a sort of function that actually introduces then the macro view, this notion of the collective systems. Of course, the cultural sector, as I somehow dived into in, in the sort of intimacy, the cultural sector is actually quite big. It's interesting that uh, 
and now I, I live in Europe, so in Europe I normally say, well, okay, you have the car industry, it's like not just the Germans, but all the other cars. And, 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 and then if you think about it, in the cultural sector, there's 2.7 times more people working in the cultural sector than in the car industry, including the car salesmen. And also the economy is a lot bigger. There's much more employment in the cultural sector than in the car industry. And we also always think as artists, oh, you know, I have to be here. I'm like the marginalized on the edge of society who doesn't really do any, doesn't really contribute other, other than non-quantifiable sort of unmeasurable ways. But that's not true. Culture is like a robust and incre incredibly important part of civic society. It's a really important co-producer of this sort of civic system, right? Suddenly we have now the opportunity for the museums to also own that, or the theaters, the music, they're, they're all of them to say, we are important. We create jobs, we, are, we can actually contribute with things that are valid and also contribute with safe spaces. We can introduce qualities that are not about commodification and commerce. It's really about questioning, well, what is civic society as such? What is it capable of? There's the question of public space. What is public space? What is public space? What's left? when the privatization has taken what it needs, and then there's this, like, kind of like this little odd negative space. Or is public space actually a proactive thing that the public co-produces together, and then they give something to the private, because fair enough, they, we need a bit of private sector as well. And in that sense, you could suddenly see that in the greater scheme of things, the cultural sector in civic society is, an, is a vehicle in which art and, and all other kinds of cultural activities is taking place and it reflects the emotional need on a collective civic scale. Normally one could say that you have the sort of the different silos in our society, so private sector, public sector. You could say, you could call it a cultural sector for that matter, but also your natural science, social science. You have all the sort of academias and business schools and so on. And the, these silos, they are all just like towers, right? And what I think is interesting, what type of interconnectivity in these silos is the ones that sort of rehumanizes society or rehumanizes the world or brings into the discussion a humanistic perspective. And this, I think, is the public sector. So the question, I think, is so interesting here with the exhibition about water. It is uh, not a silo, but it is an exhibition that goes across. And it introduces, um, I mean, questions and maybe also answers, uh, depending on who's looking and with what eyes and so on, to, this, to, to questions where we are faced with the, with the fundamental question, how on earth are we going to rehumanize the future? How are we going to recalibrate or redesign or re-engineer tomorrow? As it turns out, a lot of the things we did in the past, such as borrowing money or investing in, 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 in economical setups, it turns out to be wrong. It turned out to be fast because the price of what we did in the past was higher than what we are going to make in the future because the climate and a lot of environmental and other related ecosystem collapses are actually pushing a, a challenge to us which requires of us to take on a new imaginary future. See, so this is like some of the things I'm interested in. I'm very interested in when I make art, it's obviously very most of the time about the sort of perception, the psychology, the sort of experiential conditions, to what extent can one you know, also discover power plays, normative systems, social control, even in places where there's ex we expect to be less social control, like in a museum, there's maybe the challenge is, do people dare to sit down? Can you be noisy? Can you run? Like, is it okay to run? Probably not, because you might run into somebody. Maybe it's also nice to run a little bit. Maybe kids should run and grown-ups should run. Maybe kids should be slow and grown-ups should run. <laughs> so as to the experimentation of the not so explicit social boundaries or power boundaries, maybe the museums are actually a rare opportunity to sort of reconsider all these, all these sort of described rules. And of course, now I'm generalizing a little bit. But, but you get the picture. And, and this is when I work, I actually often like to bounce back and forth. Where is that intimacy? And how do we succeed hosting that? And where is the responsibility that comes with the macro? And how do we flex the fact that we, the culture, is so important. How do we exercise that with a kind of now convergence is so economically, but you, you know what I mean. How do we actually co-produce the reality without marginalizing ourselves much against our own wish, you could say. See, now let me pop through some, some works after this, and, and I will go a little faster uh, just so we don't dive into the works too long. Occasionally, I've been lucky to work with uh, 
sort of projects on the street. This was in Paris during the COP15. Um, it's already four years ago now, 2015. Greenland ice sent to Paris on the street. And I repeated it in London uh, in front of the Tate just um, one year ago, almost a year ago. But exactly a year ago, actually, right now. And um, so what we have is there's the COP going on. One year ago, it was in Poland, Katowice. Actually, the COP, as you might know, started two days ago in Madrid. It wasn't in, in, in Chile. What are the scientists talking about? What is the politician talking about? It's the climate report, the IPPC, no, the IPCC report on, on climate, the sort of COP document where all the data, all the sort of information is there. And in order to make that available to people, I was trying to say, well, how does that actually feel if you touch it? To make a long story short, right? So everyone obviously looks at this and say, oh, it's ice. You can see it from a great distance. And as you can see on the little girl in the upper, upper right, she says, it's cold. <laughs> and interestingly, she obviously knows it's cold, but there is a kind of knowledge in the brain. And then there's what we could refer to as embodied knowledge, so physical knowledge, things you have actually experienced. And the likelihood to have a change of behavior based on knowledge and based on embodied knowledge or physical experience is, of course, not the same. This one can debate and so on and so forth. But essentially, this project for me was both about obviously making a wonderful sculptural statement about the amazing qualities of the eyes and so on and so forth, which is actually quite poetic because they're blue, there's tiny bubbles, it pops like popcorn. And when you listen to it, you can hear pop, 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 pop. And it is, in fact, these tiny bubbles because the pressure of the eyes is so immense, like a massive glacier, like 20,000 years, squished. And once the little bubble comes to the surface of his eyes, it goes like pop. And these are the small air bubbles from which we know what was the air like 20,000 years ago. That's how we measure exactly the amount of carbon. It's like drilling into the core of the glacier, right? So there is, a, I think, an interesting sort of ambiguous uh, relationship between being on the street, being accessible to people for free, and being in the context which is in the media of, of the cops and the climate debate and so on and so forth, and actually also hosting a debate. So these things about, these questions about how do we, just touch this here, how do we touch something? And how do we feel touched? This is a drizzling water from the ceiling and a spotlight, much like one of these ones on me right here. Actually, there's a few of them here because it's a bigger version. And you can see there's some colors. Uh, uh, there seems to be like a, a rainbow curtain of some sort. And, it, when the, and when the water moves and you move around, the, as you can imagine, the rainbow kind of moves with you. Because, because obviously, it's the angle I drop light. Right? It's 45 degrees, or so 47 to 45. So I stand here. I see a rainbow here. A person stands over there, a rainbow over there. So we don't see the same rainbow. It's also interesting that. One could even argue, well, without the eye, the angle is not there, right? So then there's no rainbow. So if you look, there's a rainbow. If you look away, there's no rainbow. And in that sense, the, 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 this idea that this is a, you could say it's a sculpture or something, it depends on you looking at it. It sort of co uh, or allows you, it gives you the agency or the authorship of, of suddenly realizing that it actually depends on how I see it. Reality is relative to my own engagement, as it turns out. And this notion of sort of playing with the senses, playing with our uh, uh, I say, cognitive and nervous system, but all the way down to tricking people into thinking, if you lose sight of things, this is a, a smoke room, a tunnel, actually, uh, in which when you walk through, the light gradually changes very mildly. And you can see that when you come in, you go like, I lost sight, I'm blind. Then apparently, uh, uh, which is measurable, it takes about five to 10 seconds, maybe 15, you establish the fact, well, I'm not completely blind. I can use my hands, I can use my feet, I can also use my ears, and there's plenty of ways of navigating. It turns out that losing our navigational compass instantly sort of triggers and put on alert other sensory uh, compasses, and it's actually not so difficult. And what is interesting is afterwards, I could argue, you come out of it and you can see again, and you realize, well, the whole idea of me perceiving the world is much more relative than I thought. What I see really depends on to what extent I actually is capable of re-evaluating the way that the fact that the lens through which I see is also a cultural construct. 
we are to a great extent probably biological stuff, but the way we see and how we see and how the brain organizes what we see into our little pool of knowledge is actually highly dependent on the cultural matter. So one could argue that if you understand that the way we perceive the world is actually not necessarily representing reality, but how you select to choose and understand the world, then you're also probably capable of actually saying, well, I might change my way of seeing the world, which is also a way of changing the world. So the world as such is not solidified, defined, de given by uh, God, maybe. You know, some, something, maybe the world is really much more up to how you choose to conduct it. And in that sense, I've been curious about how our senses and how we see things and how we navigate the information we take when we see things can be made to use in, in terms of, in terms of uh, should I say, critically evaluating what is important to you in terms of your values and, and so on. This is in London some 15, 16 years ago at this very same um, museum where the other two works were, were on, is on show today at the Tate Modern. This is called The Weather Project, 2003. And um, at the time, I, in the late 90s, for the first time, heard about the Kyoto Protocol. I was still very much interested in nature. I was very much interested in, in how nature, as it turned out, increasingly became something that people gradually started to talk about as the result of human activity. So I'm old enough to remember when I, as a child, went to Iceland, with well, grandparents on a tent into nature, I realized, okay, Denmark, that's like culture, and here I am sort of walking into nature. And nature was sort of out there, and culture was like over there where I came, right? So there was this notion of, you know, human could go into nature, and certainly the atmosphere would be like beyond, you know, no human would ever actually uh, sort of claim that as a human uh, a product or, or the result of human activity. With the weather project, I was really curious about where is the weather in the city? Is the weather in the city, especially like in England where they are so obsessed uh, uh, talking about the weather, is the weather in the city actually a social space? Is it a public space? Maybe the weather is architecture. Maybe it's human, the result of human exploration, you could say. And this is a sort of a shared room, as you can see. It's a little bit like the safe space and a little bit like the work I'll talk about that I have here. There was this notion, some people, they said, I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to be contemplative, meditate. I'm going to take it easy. This slows me down. It's going to like makes me look in, and some people said, apocalypse, dystopia, the world is ending, and so on. And they sat next to each other. And it was really interesting how people sort of brought their own narrative, and they sat and laid, or however, walked through in, in, in what, whatever way, um, and explored how and why they would then see it like this. Um, there's a number of things I could say about this work, but I'm still like drifting through here a little bit, adding to the sort of context, but this is a kind of, Interesting opportunity, I think, to sort of take this idea of a collective space, because also London, in this case, has the amount of people who uh, would walk through the show, 2.2 million came. And, and in that sense, I also before that, that's just like two years before the show in London, work with this notion of gardens and places we can be. And as you can see, this is a rammed earth floor here on the right. It's Peter Sumter's Museum in Bregenz, uh, in, in, Bregenz uh, in Austria. And uh, as you can see, it's just slightly tilting, but just a little bit. So you can see it sort of slides down. And it's really wonderful to walk because you go like, oh, oh. So this subtle feeling of destabilization, I think actually is interesting because it not only distorts the sense, sort of the obsessive central perspective that Peter Sumter uh, seems to be like, in a very German way, kind of obsessed about, but it also has this uh, slight physical destabilization, which brings attention as you might have an opportunity to try in the work that I have here, brings attention to this kind of potential of, of this slight discomfort of having to recompose the rules with which you use. Motoric, gravitational, destabilization, and so on. I'll show that. And then there's a few other sort of artistic uh, uh, experiments uh, as a such. It was called um, the mediated motion uh, this is a very early work of mine to, to add to the context. So in South Africa, Johannesburg, a small rainwater reservoir uh, used for watering city plants and so on. I took a little pump, diesel pump at the time, it's like 93. No, nobody knew diesel was going to be so 
it was like going to be like cigarettes. But essentially, um, I emptied the water reservoir out on the street and created a little stream that ran through uh, the city called erosion as a little action without announcing it or telling it to anyone. And obviously, mo most people just thought it was a leak. Um, <laughs> but this notion of friction or the idea of, of when a space actually allows you to experience the slight destabilization of friction, it also creates a space in which you are being given the task, you say, the this slight discomfort or the kind of opportunity to sort of slow down and recompose, should I say, the rules. Here is the uh, museum in Denmark, Luciana, where the work I have on show here, which now is a little unfair because you came here, you will you sort of see it um, uh, on a picture before you're experiencing it. But obviously you can see this gentleman jumping the river, or this little tiny bit of water at the front. He's like busy, he's not gonna get wet shoes. Whereas the two wonderful people sitting at the back there having a, a chat about something else and so on and so forth. So it became like a highly diversified space. If you look at a painting gallery, everybody goes like, okay, painting, and then they go next, oh, next painting. And there's a sort of highly synchronized behavioral uh, pattern. And here you have a very diversified, uh, I think, opportunity. And everyone, of course, is somehow sorting out, well, what does it do to my, what does it do to my, well, to my shoes, first of all, but also <laughs> to my feet. I mean, how does this touch me underneath my feet? And you're kind of like walking through it. And gradually, I think that, and this is one of the reasons why I brought this show, I'll just say a little bit more about that. It offered me an, an opportunity when referring to this as a riverbed, it offered me also an opportunity to see if I could create an intimacy, which, and now I'll give you a few clues that you can use when you are in it, um, um, maybe tomorrow or however, or whenever you choose to see it. There's no shadows in the room. As you can see, it is e equally distributed. The light has a certain pitch, so there is a slightly lesser color. It's not very colorful also. It's not completely black and white or anything, but it has this. There is in a riverbed, as we know, because the river has just gone back or it's run out in Iceland, it's because the snow has melted, the end of spring, the summer comes, and the riverbed appears. Because it was just full of water, you stand there and you realize there's no seeds, there's no grass, there's nothing, which means there's no insects, there's no, no activity, and because no insects, there's no birds, there's nothing. There's a bit of water left, but what you really feel is the absence of everything. There's not even a shadow to confirm that I'm physically even there, which uh, maybe I'm not also. Maybe it's not really even happening. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's a space in which we are sort of uh, between the end of the river having died out and the beginning of something else. Again, some people would take that as a rock garden, Japanese garden, the opportunity to sort of slow down. And some people would say, my God, it's like a mudslide. It's like, boah, poof, totally, you know, devastating and so on. And it's so interesting to see how people, they kind of dynamically get in. But what is more interesting is this, like really you have to sort of find your step and it's like one is loose and it's like really uncomfortable. And so funny to come into the museum to really get into trouble like that. How, how generous I think it is of Chris and Geraldine to actually offer us the opportunity to kind of get a little messy. You know, like messy, not, yeah, like uh, actually messy, um, slowed down and, and having to refine our feet. And obviously there's plenty of Asian gardens which introduces the surface of the rocks as a foot massage. They're not quite as uh, sort of messy as this, but you know, so you could choose to come with very thin shoes uh, and you could actually see it as a, as, a, as a sort of, what is it called, like zone therapy, therapeutic exercise where it's like seeing with your feet. Maybe you also just like kind of take your eye. You don't have to close your eyes. It's not so good. But you could also just, they just like kind of, okay, why don't I try to go through the exhibition seeing it with my feet? And sense the absence of water, especially as we know when standing in a riverbed, the first thought is, in fact, imagine if the water suddenly comes. And I'm like out here in the middle of the riverbed and it was just like kind of flood down here. And, and, and you might imagine or know the feeling which I actually haven't tried, but so I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say it all the time, but standing in an empty swimming pool is the funniest feeling because what you feel is not necessarily the sort of the frame of the pool, it's actually the absence of the water. You go like, you can almost sense the volume, which is not there. So it somehow opens up for the presence 
of absence. It sort of gives you access to something that is not there. It's like seeing the void of something that is an imagination. And this is why I like the, this idea of there is actually nothing there except us and the stones. And these are just rocks and stones from just from around here. It's like really nothing special. You could do this at home easily, actually. <laughs> and, and, the point, and the point is, obviously, it's a little bit like breathing. When you breathe, you have the inhale and the exhale. But there's the top of the exhale. Before you start the inhale, there's a little space there. It's like a riverbed, right? You're almost dead for a short, tiny, because you're not doing anything, right? So, there's, so this idea of the hinge of reality is, I think, something really incredibly powerful here, because even though there is a bit of water, it is a riverbed, it's very much about how you use your head and your body to, to take this work of art in. And don't hesitate to sort of diversify your, your activity. Don't be afraid of you know, lay down and do a rock snowman. You know? <laughs> uh, you know, you know, it's just the principle of, I think the museum, if any place, is actually capable of, I mean, there will be somebody stopping you if you're, if you're sort of breaking too far off. But this is, if we're not going to do it here, if we're going to have a hard time uh, doing it anywhere. We probably need to do it a little bit. Okay. How about it? Because it's always a balance. Do you say too much? So how should I say? But I thought I should say it. As you saw, this museum in Denmark where I showed it, it's a very different, I can say, much more domestic and so on. It's so exciting to have it here in its full, it's like f full scale and so on. It's a, it's a very different experience altogether um, when it is here. So I have a few work, just like Ice Watch. This was an older work of mine, um, Green River, it's called. It's dye. It's not uh, toxic. Dropped it into the water. Everybody, obviously, is either drawn to it because it actually is fluorescent, so the daylight makes it really glow. The police in Sweden, this is Stockholm, the police said, don't worry, it's OK. The, the government, which is right there behind it, had a leak in the, in the sort of heating system. And, and they sorted it out. It's all fine now. So, <laughs> and then they found out the next day in the paper, uh, it, they found out it was a work of art, someone. And, they say, and then the art critic wrote about it. So it's so funny, straight from the police to the art critic. And the art critic said it was the worst sort of watercolor he had ever seen. <laughs> so I got a really bad review. Um, and, and it, says, and it says a lot about Sweden also, right? You know, how they deal with stuff. And nobody ever had the chance to get worried and everyone, you know, everyone felt taken care of, either by the police or by the art critic. <laughs> um, but one could say, very often, as we know, these waterways, the rivers in the cities, are the rivers through our lands. They're like, they're like veins through everything. And obviously, the rivers used to be incredibly important routes of transportation and trade and, and how things were built and so on. So they were like, they were like simply the, the, the life of, of the areas. And now they've just become these sort of glamorous backdrops to which people pay less attention. And, and obviously this is a, a more complex debate. But the principle I think is interesting that we have become blind or we have become numb to the fact that there's something here. There's something quite magic. There's something really unique also here, the river. Right? Imagine the... Brisbane without the river, uh, and 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 how do we now actually make the river explicit so that it is the river first and the city afterwards? Is it the river, the positive space, and this, this the city sort of the way that it's framed, or is the river the negative space because we can't build there? But then it's like just like what's left because we can't build a house on there. And there's a lot of um, you know interesting opportunities in in that discussion. Um, I think the notion is, if you can flip it around and say, maybe the river is, the, is more important than the city. First of all, it's been there long before the, 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 the city. And also the river, maybe, when you look at the way the color moves through it, it's much more real. In Stockholm, for instance, I can see that's not the case in, in Brisbane, you cannot build out of a certain code, so you're not allowed to put modern architecture. It's a little unfair to the Swedes now, but, but you know, anyway, so, so it kind of looks like a museum. It's just like, if it's not like an old building, you cannot put it in the city center because it's like, it has to look a certain way. You have to, I'm generalizing a little bit, just for the sake of the point. So, is it a real city then? If it's supposed to look like something from 100 years ago, 
Well, then, no, no, it's like uh, trying to like historicize some historicism is like sneaking I its way into building programs and to sort of flip that around and show, well, the reality is maybe in the water and the city is fake. Right? It's just pretending to be 100 years old. It's an interesting architectural discussion. And, and obviously, nowadays, the, the discussions about water and river and the context of this, you, you saw that maybe two years ago, the river Ganga in India was given rights of personhood. So obviously, I, I was thinking, this, this is interesting. So legislatively speaking, which is not my strength, the river Ganga can sue a company should they pollute higher than a certain degree of polluters. Just like the famous lawyer in London, James Thornton, with his legal firm, huge firm, 50, 50 full-time and 200 sort of volunteer lawyers. James Thornton sued the city of London five years ago, representing the heir of London. And he won. And the heir of London got, uh, you know, well, from a civic or from a, you know, a rights perspective, this heir of London won that the city pollutes too much. And there is a legislative system for how much polluters there can be in the city. Just as a sort of as to the future, what is the rivers? Maybe we are in a situation now where a lot of non or beyond human entities are going to be granted various types of rights, legislatively speaking and so on. There's plenty of legislation already. You cannot build a high rise in a flight route of migrating birds, for instance, been in the law already for quite some time. So, so as to the role of water and the idea that water is an interesting entity as it is also increasingly common. The question of can you privatize drink water? It's like a huge debate. Is that well? It's, a, it's because it comes up of that land, but you actually the water went into this land. And so when underground it came up here, the person who owns this land, and so on. Right? Do, you, do you see the point? Water. It's so it's so incredibly inspiring. Yes. Here we have more water waterfall. Oh, so I should just maybe briefly. This is New York, Hudson River. The mayor, mayor's office, and a public sort of a foundation for public art called Public Art Fund, 2007. I'm going to just take this one, which is at the Tate. It's kind of funny. Richard Rogers. Do you see all this sort of? He he did with Renzo Piano. He did Pompidou in Paris in the, in the early. See the scaffold, like scaffold, scaffold, same same. Um, so, 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 so it's like a kind of a waterfall, constructed water, man-made waterfall, you could say. And there's, there's plenty of opportunities, as you probably, the ones of you who hike out in the, in, in the um, amazing nature here in Australia, if you have waterfalls, I'm sure you do. <laughs> so when you stand in a landscape and you wonder, how far away is this plint, the speaker's plint over there for me? And if there would be water falling down from it, and the waterfall would fall really slowly, hit at the base, then it would be a hundred meter high plinth really far away. But if the water would just fall down like this, which is wood, it's about 10 meters and it's a very small plinth, roughly the size of what I need to speak in. Do you see, so, so the waterfall entered, introduces a scaling device. I, by looking at the water, can see how far away things are. And once I can see how far away things are, I can also see, well, then I can measure the perspective from the waterfall to me, and I can see, oh, it's going to take me, uh, here's it's just going to take me five seconds. Or in the case it's 100 meters long, like the ones in Brooklyn or, or in, in, in Iceland for that matter, in Australia, I, when looking at the river and the water and the way it works and moves, you can also see a scale. And when that happens, as I said before, you can also see yourself. And there's a degree of presence because suddenly you can triangulate, okay, this mountain does not move when I walk, but the one mountain which is equally high moves a lot and gets closer very fast. That means that the one that moves closer to me is a smaller mountain and the one far away, or the one that does not move is a big mountain far away. Do you understand? So, so there is a kind of motoric physical way of organizing space, which we obviously hasn't been, we have not really activated because we just walk around here in Brisbane, maybe walk around the river, but this notion of questioning, are we here? Do we need to sort of evaluate the scale of things? is not really necessary in a city, even though it's not an unhealthy thing to sort of use your surroundings to establish the fact that we exist. 
<laughs> that totally made no sense, but it sounded very good. <laughs> sounded very good, huh? And we add the tape as to the point. I, uh, you don't have to read it. You can read it if you want. But so I was preparing an exhibition at the Tate, and and as the Tate was taking a lot of, and, and rightfully so, credit for having organized the ice blocks and 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 announced that I was a so-called so sort of climate conscious artist, which, which is. Um, which is an interesting sort of debate, and one can talk in detail about it. But at some point, just a week into my show, the tape went out much to um, my effort of making them also a, a change agent and showing that cultural institutions have a responsibility. And they came out and declared a climate emergency. It was very interesting. And this is one of the macro examples, right? Suddenly you have a, a really great leading institution uh, in the world who takes upon the, what I said in the beginning about the macro responsibility to show that the cultural sector is actually not just the final sort of the last resort of, of reality when it has, when everyone else, like the car industry, who is obviously not doing so much, has taken off, taken center space, center states. That's a little convoluted there, I'm sorry, but do you, do you understand? So, so I really worked a lot and tried to inspire the partners I work with on exhibitions to also sort of reflect upon what is their role. And of course, this allowed me then to also show a new work at the Tate, where we just put a recent work up showing a work that I did in 98, uh, in 99, 98, 99, I documented glaciers in Iceland. I walked a lot in Iceland across the glaciers and I always, I always got so upset I could never really on the glacier. I mean, you could still do a great photo, but you could never really see it until I took a tiny little propeller plane a little bit like these small Cessnas you use all, all, all everywhere here in Australia as well. And, and then, you know, I finally got up and took a proper photo. And then now, 20 years later, I thought, okay, because of Tate, and the Tate had made this climate thing, and so why don't I do it again and hang it next to each other? So I've been making these uh, photos now in a photo series and showed it then at the Tate. And, and this has become a, a work that is now traveling a bit and is doing, you know, interestingly, in, inside and outside of the art world. So at the Tate, we, we talked about, so what can we then do? And, and obviously the Tate has plenty on their mind. But one of the things that I was fortunate to do is because of my kitchen at in the studio, which I have really, I, and I really have to credit the people who run the kitchen for, for the effort on being climate conscious and addressing questions on, 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 of ecological nature and so on. The, we, we said to the Tate, why don't we take over your restaurant? And not only we'll take it over, we'll also make a, a, a menu which is the food as it is according to the Paris Agreement has to be in 2030. So the menu is based on the fact that we need to decrease the carbon footprint with 50%, 51%, I think, and, and, and in order to succeed to be as a Europe, no, as a world uh, 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 Paris Agreement. Now, of course, America is not in it anymore and all of that. But, you know, so, and it's funny because, you know, we have now 2020 very soon, right? So we have 10 years. So we have to do 50% in 10 years. So it's a 5% every year. This is an example of a menu. And it was interesting because it was massively successful because people said, oh, let's try how the food is going to taste in 2030. Because it's very easy to make, so it's really not difficult. But it says, as you can see downstairs, Oh, this is like, this is the rear side of the menu, but it says, you know, the average British food, and the British food is not very carbon friendly. Um, but this, I'll just show you some pictures of my kitchen. It's like always when my kitchen cook, it looks like a Goya painting. So they can, <laughs> see? It's like, it's like so, uh, who doesn't want to eat with them? And here they are all eating. No, so the, so the idea of the studio has become, I wouldn't call it, a kind of uh, um, activist uh, platform because it's it's not it is an artist studio but we take upon various type of experimentations also uh, in periods where I have students involved which I haven't had lately but I had a teaching commitments and these are attempts in collaboration with the students the world upside down very easy um, I don't know what they're doing here <laughs> but you know city walks and 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 so on or like, you know, walking as one body, how different ways of walking as one body, and then various sort of workshops, and so on and so forth. And the studio as such, just to sort of here to the end, works with a number of spatial experiments. The spatial experiments takes on various shapes. We work with social sciences, natural sciences, but also with people who are maybe one step further away, like economists, 
people who are in you know music industry and dance industry or in, in other cultural fields and people who are essentially a specialist within very narrow markets up there we're trying to 3d scan a block of ice and the scanner just did not like ice because it's wet or somehow and it was so difficult until we realized we could just put red powder on it and then the scanner was really happy again and so on and so forth so so we experiment and play a lot and occasionally i even take all the sort of junk that comes out of experimenting and present that as a as a little display of you know misfortunes and 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 the successes uh, side by side um, this is called the model room um, today so finally having dragged you through very quickly uh, i have a few sort of more architectural works this is a rainbow just like you saw it at the beginning except here it well it's kind of the same if you walk it changes right if you stand there it's yellow if you walk over here it's red if you walk over here it's blue so suddenly it's like your feet again right so you're like walking through and see okay here the city Aarhus Aros Museum is red and you realize if I want to see the city red no go to yellow I need to walk it's very interesting so so who is now the painter right so okay I walk so the people you know going around or the children running around or however one then chooses to do it you could argue that this is sort of an interesting thing is and and the, the and the fact that the whole city here is a painting is something that I'm interested about and just the details so when you are in, as you very well know in a red glass behind a red glass your eyes immediately tries to correct it because your brain says oh it cannot be red what's wrong then you start to see green and if you focus and look at the red it is as if it's fading because the green is so sort of, and it takes about 80 seconds to sort of peak green peak right 80 seconds and then it's like oh it's actually not that red but if you have now green then you look towards the yellow and you see it with green eyes because it also takes 80 seconds to sort of stabilize yourself and you go this is funny it was ye yellow before but now I'm walking it's like kind of greenish yellow so very very green yellow but then you walk in and you realize this is so weird because now the opposite the complementary color so yellow is purple so you have a fade in your brain going from green to purple it's really ugly and you have a physical thing which is from red to yellow do you see how then somebody walks really fast next to you and then you say can you see the purple and the guy's like what are you talking about i don't see it because <laughs> he didn't spend 80 seconds no, so the, the point here is that this is how we see the world but we never see the world the same way and and the fact that we take it for granted also this is how marketing is actually presenting the world to us like this car is a masterpiece it's not negotiable it's not this is how it is right that's not true it's highly debatable it can change and if you look at it this way that's why if you look at a diesel engine it's different than looking at an electric engine and so on and so forth so i've gone into some architectural experiments this is in iceland this is in denmark this is in copenhagen also in denmark and as to some extent they are and I, I don't want to dive too long into that, but they are also spatial experiments. You have the Copenhagen Harbor front, and there's a sort of bicycle path. And you know how bicycles are, they just do not stop, right? So they just go so fast, especially in Copenhagen. And I say, okay, why don't we make not uh, like this bridge here, which is also really uh, interesting. It's like, as, as, as my partner said, this is like architectural strobe light. But, but you know, so you have the, so I hope that, that, that was actually, I like strobe light. Like you have a bicycle path and pedestrian path. Actually, it's the, you have two pedestrians. So if somebody comes against you, it's like, it's like over there and you have the bikes in the middle. But so here I said, why don't we just introduce the fact that people have to sort of kind of find out how not to bump into each other. So it's almost like suggesting there is a space or pia sort of a plaza or piazza, if you want, or it's like five boats and people would sort of kind of slow down which is great and if you slow down you also see more and and you kind of have to be careful not to so, sort of um, bump in and somebody maybe just go to the railing and sit down or stand and have a you know, have a chat and and so it's a city space on the water a little bit like the public things i said at the beginning so now i'm going to end with a little work 
uh, one, the biggest and the smallest work, uh, which is actually a small solar lantern. Normally, I actually always have it in my hand, so I apologize for not having one with me, but I understand you are so incredibly lucky it's actually on sale in the museum store. Obviously, on the other side of this lamp, there is a little solar lantern. Um, and it, the way it works is that it is sold for a higher price in areas uh, where there is access to energy. Not that you, I mean, occasionally you also have power cuts and all of that. But this is a photo from Nepal, Nepal after the earthquake there. Um, so it's a social entrepreneurship project, but it is very much about replacing the fossil fuels with solar energy in a handheld size. And just three days ago, we delivered uh, little son, as it's called, number one million. So it's actually incredible. We started six or seven years ago, to be fair. And, and we have, uh, obviously, we thought this is going to be like the easiest thing in the world because this is like so amazing. But it turns out it's a, it's a little harder than we thought. But nevertheless, we are, in a, in a, as a matter of fact, primarily working in the uh, global um, north at a, at a sort of a gathering funds and organizing. But we're also trying to introduce the replacement of what you see here, that's a petroleum or kerosene lantern. Uh, in a, it's basically like a Molotov cocktail uh, in, in a cup there, replacing that with solar energy. And, and, and a lot can be said, but maybe what is important is also obviously to see this as a lantern, which is the same here in Brisbane as it is in the uh, global, uh, uh, global south. It's funny, Australia is like also global south. So now I have to... But to, to find, uh, you know, a language that is shared and common where it's the same solar lantern that is used for these guys here doing their homework. And in that sense, um, I'm trying to introduce this notion that if we can do it successfully, we can also introduce it into a smaller or a newly started or a sort of a micro private sector. So it's actually, actually, I hope to be a part of the local economy rather than just dropping the planes as if some well-minded uh, Westerner, again, would somehow fly by and throw out, you know, used clothes and whatever we always uh, tend to um, distribute. So the project has, as its main core, the question of replacing uh, uh, solar, uh, replacing fossil fuels with solar, but to do it in a way that is locally, you know, sustainably also in terms of economy and so on and so forth. I say it because... Uh, um, it's because it's Christmas now. It's a Christmas you can buy here. That's for, uh, and, and so on. And you can go in on the Little Sun homepage and you, see, you can see it. And uh, you always think, okay, so one lamp. So one million lamps. So as I say, oh, I had the numbers, but you, know, you think it's really not so much oil that it replaces. But it's a lot. When there's 100,000, 500,000, suddenly all these small pieces of petroleum actually becomes quite a bit. And obviously, we only just got started. But just to sort of a little bit like this fundraising, uh, what do you call it, um, sort of where you fundraise, everyone puts together a little bit. And suddenly, you have, a, I think, a, an argument which becomes robust because it is so incredibly decentralized. And this notion that we are, in fact, we are, in fact, by sharing, capable of ma massive things. Actually, this is a cop. It's so funny, the cop. Um, where all the heads of states and oh, whoever, I mean, the, the sort of climate politicians, and obviously this oil-producing country down here on the right. And maybe, it's a, maybe it's actually an Australian coal producer. Uh, you know, it's not very happy, but, but otherwise I'm normally out there, you know, punching, uh, punching people's wallet, uh, dragging people into theaters like this, doing sort of artistic campaigning uh, promotion for Lil Son. I won't, I won't endure you with that type of stuff uh, here today. Um, and yes, I think that's pretty much it. I know I spoke a little fast, but just to sort of, um, and we'll take it maybe not to be completely conclusive, but as you can see, I really strongly believe in that culture or art has a capacity or sort of a, a mus muscle, if you want, to touch and move things beyond uh, what is in the immediate comfort zone of art. We can, in the comfort zone, like at a museum like this one, we can do highly precise things because we have the sort of incredible precision of being in a gallery where there's nothing else than looking at the art. And sometimes art can also be on the outside. It's not a qualitative measure. You can have great art who's never outside. So it's not that I'm claiming this is the right way to do it. But I do think that there is an opportunity here where we who are in the cultural sector, and that's not just the artists, but really everyone, is, is, a, is in a situation where we should stop under evaluating ourselves, underselling ourselves. Because the truth is, 
nobody is afraid of lifting up if the artist loses the pen, right? If you think about it, it's really interesting. Even the Queen of England would bend down and take the pen up if they were lost by an artist. Obviously, uh, it's just to kind of uh, add to this, to the fact that I think we uh, also, in a humble and respectful way, we need to own that. We need to own the fact that culture and art and so on is actually such an incredible, now I say the wrong, wrong word, currency, but just like so people actually get it, you know, currency, and we just need to learn how to respectfully and inclusively and radically and critically trade that. Thank you so much. You covered a phenomenal amount of ground um, in that hour or so. Oliver, it was fantastic. But I'm going to bring you back to the piece of ground in this exhibition, which is Riverbed. And you used the word dreamlike at one point in terms of how you kind of experience that work when you first walk into it. And you're experiencing it, of course, in the confines of a gallery space. And yet what draws you into that sort of lived experience of nature in a setting in which the natural order is normally suspended, as it is in the art museum? I'm struck by a statement of yours that you made in the Tate publication. We walk into a museum in order to see reality in higher resolution. Is that how Riverbed works, by amplifying the things that might otherwise go unnoticed in their normal settings? Well, I said it really. Also, um, like the way I say it about an artist studio, because many people make the mistake and think that going to the museum is like escapism. It's like yeah. getting away. Wow, finally I can get out of the dreary daily life. <laughs> But the thing is, in the museum, you actually just go even deeper into it and even closer to it and so on. And the point is, too, because there is, a, there is also historically maybe a tradition for sort of a kind of elitist sort of marginalization and museums are like the kind of luxury palaces on the periphery of society. Yeah. And maybe we, we... So the sentence actually comes out of sort of, you know, trying to, to actually take center, center states. Yeah. And just by simply saying it, yeah. we, are, we are not at the periphery. And yes, I actually think when you take a piece of landscape, a riverbed from Iceland, which is now we use the stone here from, like from outside, but, but I mean, if you take a whole riverbed, which everybody knows, it was like, and, and a journalist said to me today, but, but why don't I just go out, there's like a riverbed there, there's dried up, let's just go there. Yeah, well, you can. I said, it's not so bad, not so you should. But if you take it and put it into a museum, it's a sort of reframing. Yeah. It's sort of a, it's, uh, and obviously you're suddenly in a situation, ooh, interestingly, the stones are real, the water is like so real. We know it's not real, but it's so real that the museum seems unreal. Yeah. And it has this opportunity to sort of turn reality around and realize sometimes the unreal is more real and the real yeah. is unreal. It's like some architecture yeah. is like trying to make a point and realize if we can flip the constructed and the real yeah. back and forth like that. Maybe I'm actually in a position to, to take a stronger stand on the fact that yeah. things can change. Yeah. I think the thing that's really surprising when not having experienced the work in Louisiana but seeing lots of images of it, it's the acoustic dimension of the experience of going into the space, the sort of crunch of the gravel. Um, you feel and hear your own body weight sort of interacting with the surface. And the water, you know, when it's quiet enough, you hear this water sort of stream coursing and burbling through the space. That's something you never hear ordinarily in a museum space. But as you said before, there are no insects, there's no wildlife, there's no plant life. But so it's a very kind of stripped down version of the natural experience. But it's very hard not to feel that you're really, your whole body is in play and you're more and more conscious of how your body behaves because of all of those sounds you hear and the things you were describing about the way the space makes you move. Yes, and you have, you look into the space, you go like, is that like, am I seeing 15 or is it 25, is it 30 meters? And you go like, then suddenly, finally, there's a person up there, you go, wow, yeah. it's a really long person because there was no, there's no car, there's no house, there's no cow, yeah. no kangaroo. So you don't, you're just like, it's like, um, you're, you're, you're physically disembodied. Yeah. But once you start to move, you realize, oh, it's also moving. I mean, it's not moving, but, you know, perspective moves. And you suddenly see the size. So it is very much about taking in the world with your body yeah. and less like a postcard. Um, 
Only using your, your yeah. eyes. I don't think I've ever been in any museum exhibit where you stand on one side and look through and into it and the person at the end of your gaze is almost Lilliputian. <laughs> you know, I mean, you look enormous down at the ground, but when you're up there, everything, the perspective really sort of collapses, doesn't it? So it's like society. We use each other to put perspective on things. Mm. Ooh, that's a good title for the next show. But, <laughs> no, but so, so, and, and obviously, what I recommend you to try, uh, which you probably will do anyway, uh, as it turns out, uh, take your phone, look at it, and you realise a little like this room is like very steep. You take a picture, completely flat. Yeah. It's like it just shows how crap the phone yeah. is. There's so much. <laughs> no, I mean, as to, yeah. as to represent a physical entity. Yeah. So much of your early work, and you talked about some of it, is about self-perception and heightening uh, a viewer's self-awareness as they move into a space like the tunnel, for argument's sake, that's, uh, that's at the Tate at the moment. But in many ways, it seems to be about building a deeper understanding of the world outside the work. Is that sort of central to what you're trying to do in those early works that about the way in which we see and experience and live in the world? I mean, as a threat in the works, there is this question of the nomification to have become numb, because it's also just not so necessary anymore to be able to sort of see a distance and things mm. like that. But, but so there's the, the, the need for sensitizing certain things that are often highly embodied or, you know, the relationship between the body and the mind. And that, I think, allows us to make a better judgment of how to conduct our life. And there's a further element to that if we feel we are in that, should I say, dialogue with the world, if we feel that we are co-producing with the world, if we feel that the world actually hands over the trust, yeah. and if I can sense the trust, I'm also more likely to vote, and maybe I will take imp imp social empath empathic principles into consideration in my voting, mm. and I'm less likely to, le likely to be radicalized because yeah. radicalization, I think, very often comes out of people feeling not listened to. Yeah. So there's an interesting opportunity, and, and it does not have to be the, the sort of all about embodiment and so on. It's just using some of the very basic tools like nature or what mm. was normally called nature back when I was a child, and suddenly I think there is <laughs> a relationship. Still is. No, not really, actually. Yeah. No, I mean, some people call it nature, but that's just because they haven't seen that it is, uh, in, in this sort of spec spectacle of the Anthropocene, I think one mm. have come to the conclusion there is no nature left, right? Mm. I mean, you, you, that's a proper discussion some other day. But, 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 you know, I mean, it wasn't in the French and the Germans, it was in Belgium. And funny enough, it was not east-west because there was sort of a, a certain river. Two trenches, just very briefly. Trends, trends, French, German, and the Germans, um, they were like suddenly, uh, oh, the wind is in the back. Mm. Then they said, let's just pop some gas, and the gas, being heavier than air, just floated drifted. and drifted into the trenches. It was a horrible story, First World War, and suddenly the air, for the first time, was made explicit by weaponization, mm -hmm. and it was not out of human reach anymore. Mm. So this notion of, you know, the fact that there is nothing that has not been utilitarized or functionalized or commodified, the River Ganga has the rights mm. of personhood mm. now. It's mm. going to sue us if we don't... Um, mm. I mean, it's just, a, it's just so interesting. So um, I think the sensitization is not an esoteric wellness spa type of, ooh, I have to be... Like, it's, it's really about finding out how on earth are we going to make sure that the present is navigated by the future mm. and not the past. Mm. In what ways do you think art can motivate change in the world? And I mean that in the broader sense. Some of your work, um, and clearly what you're doing with Little Son, is a fantastic sort of social equity, social justice project, making light and energy available in much safer ways to people in the world that simply don't have that availability at the moment. And in a sense, charging... Um, wealthier, developed countries for the privilege of supporting that enterprise. That's a good example, obviously, of social justice in play that an artist has activated. But in terms of other kind of work that you make, um, and maybe the, um, uh, 
the, the work that you showed in London outside Tate Modern, uh, the ice work is a good example of that. You drew attention to something in a way that really caused people to respond in a way that they might not otherwise to an IPCC report or a scientific paper or something of that kind. So do you think art has got an increasingly powerful potential to really shift attitudes towards some of the bigger, more pressing issues in the world, you know, not least climate change? Well, I think, I think there is, there's art and then there's artists. And I think artists like myself and, and, and whoever wants to, just like people as such, civic participants, have to make up their mind whether they're going to act or do something and something. Mm. It's not because they're artists, but just because art is then what they happen to work with and then they can use... Well, just like somebody who does makes milk can consider how to do it in a more green and efficient way. So this is the artist. We have no more or less responsibility than anyone else. And, and, uh, and then there's the actual art itself. I think it's incredibly important to state that art cannot be functionalized as, as a principle. And I think it's always a balance because suddenly if you functionalize art completely, it's commodity. It's, it's, it's like marketing, it's like communication. But we also have to see that the cultural structure, the systems in which art normally operates, is not a free space, it's not a neutral space. Like, it's also it's like full of art fairs, which is like basically not about art, but about commodity. So in a sense, we have a situation where uh, there is also the need to sort of reevaluate the crit and, and sort of critique what is the outreach potential? Have the museums or, or sort of under uh, utilitarize their responsibility in being inclusive to greater mm. society? So some of these projects where you can say, uh, uh, like the eyes in front of the museum, it's also about the permanuity, is it called? Like the sort of, uh, really need, it's really important that the city is also part of the museum and the museum also has a bit of the mm. city inside of itself. Yeah. It just happens here we are in a kind of, in a sort of more professionalized way, it can be highly intimate with one small painting and spend 20 minutes. It's very hard in the city. But, but essentially, I, I, I think art is art. And had we not had climate challenges, the ice blocks would still be a great work of art. Um, and, 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 and I think there's, it's always important, there's, as I said with the pen, there's nothing higher than art. Yeah. Or as Gerhard Richter said, the German painter who you showed here, right? Yeah. Art is the highest form of hope. Mm. Mm. Well, I think if there's anything that is relentlessly present in your work, it's that sense of hope. I just wanted to turn, lastly, to contemporary art museums, which I think at their best are places, social spaces in which we can engage in public conversations that we can't always have as easily or as readily outside. And obviously, the power of art can be very provocative and suggestive to really get those conversations occurring. Um, how do you see the role of the Contemporary Art Museum in this regard and what more could or should we be doing in order to foster that kind of dialogue and discussion? Oh, that's a big, that's a big question. <clears throat> no, but for, essentially I think cultural institutions like a great museum like this and, 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 and the whole like, handful of uh, massive institutions you have just around, the, uh, just here, right? It, for me, it's more like it's a, like a forum. It's like a kind of marketplace, almost like where people get together. It's a I wouldn't call it a parliament, but there's like this unbelievable sort, sort of, of agora or public yeah, space. agora is a good yeah. word, yes. Yeah. And 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 now it's the question: we should also be careful not to sort of immediately take over the the sort of the pace and the the speed of the more commodity-driven forums, which is very fast, noisy, and so on, mm. because it takes away the contemplative or the sort of slightly slower qualities. Maybe we need a really slow agora mm. that can speed, speed up occasionally. And in that sense, um, we also need to understand it's not language-driven only, mm. because people tend to say, well, if I can't measure, if I can't quantify or say it, is it then something? Yeah. Maybe we need to also take the responsibility and host for art to be abstract mm. and for living some time, mm. uh, you know, maybe it takes 10 years for a painting to r arrive at the point in time where it can be articulated in a, in a mm. good text. So, yeah. so and, and, and the question here is for me more about the self-confidence or lack of self-confidence in, in institutions because by, by, by virtue of having been best by politicians in delivering quantifiable successes and, de and, and taking, otherwise taking away money, you have so low self-esteem um, in, in many institutions that they over explain, so there's a work of others like long explanations and people to stand and guide people and so on, that at the end, p 
people visiting the museum, they also become low self-esteem because they feel that they are too stupid to mm. see anything for themselves. And, 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 and in a very weird way, museums in that way are sort of losing the self-trust. And, and this is a big discussion, which is why mm. I'm happy, and because I really quite seriously mean this, what you have achieved here with Goma, also over the years, this show is very exciting. I'm so proud to be a part of it. But it's also much about you know this, the 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 resilience of being able to continue, right? So yeah. and yeah. much to you, uh, Chris, but also the the kind of the is the, how to create a team where there's sort of a mm. you know a team which has a sense of direction. Yeah. Um, and and this is how museums, I think get out of that lack of self-confidence, mm. uh, um, which people eventually also, uh, I think, um, struggle with. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like yeah. being a good host. Yeah, again, I right? think what museums like ours want to do more than anything is establish a kind of a trust or a compact between what it is they present to the public and how the public feel welcomed into that. And you're right, if we patronise the public, we're simply going to turn them off and turn them away. So... The aim is certainly to go in the opposite direction and to make sure that this is a welcoming institution, that it welcomes and hosts works like yours and all the other artists that comprise water, and that uh, by coming here you can discover things about yourselves that otherwise might not even occur to you but for the experience of those works. And maybe you need to yeah. come by a few times before yourself. Yeah, exactly. So maybe it's also OK that you don't get it. But like maybe doubt is an under-traded state of consciousness which we need yeah. to embrace. Yeah. I am not afraid of saying I'm uncertain, yeah. but I'm still good enough. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a perfect note <laughs> for us to conclude our conversation on. Um, I hope that all of you um, will join me in very warmly thanking Olafur. I think he's given tremendous generosity and energy to this presentation. I feel like I've experienced perhaps four um, in the time it might otherwise take to present one. So much information, oh, such a rich um, gift that I think he's given to all of us that are present tonight. And for those of you that do get the opportunity um, to see the show and hopefully to see it um, in the very near future and to see it again and again, there's also a major publication that Geraldine and a number of other writers have contributed to, which I really urge you to read. Mm. And sort of on that same thing, I'm not really here to promote the Tate, but I have to say that the Tate publication is really striking because it includes interviews that you do with about 25 or 30 people from uh, all sorts of arenas of life, specialities, scientists, economists. Um, you draw an incredibly wide network of people into your orbit. And I think that uh, through the conversation that you've had with our audience tonight, um, you've opened up a big orbit for them as well. So oh, would you, you please join me in thanking Oliver? Thank you. 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 Thank you.